Good morning and welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. It's great that we can be together in worship and fellowship in this first Sunday uh, in the season of Lent. And so welcome to all who are here this morning, whether uh, you're in the sanctuary or watching on Facebook Live or perhaps uh, later today or this week. However that we can be connected, that is the important thing. A week from yesterday will be our team walking. And Belva, do you want to share a word about that? I can. Okay. And you have another announcement as well. Good morning, everybody. As Pastor Ben alluded, next Saturday night from 4 to 7, the Centenary Soulmates are going to be walking from Miriam's house. Uh, it, it is exciting to see so many team members. So you still have the opportunity to join the coolest group that is going to be out there. Um, and you still have time to donate. Now, I am happy to take your donations. You just click on my name and you can put all the donation you want in there. However, if you do not want to play favorites, <laughs> you can um, just donate to the team overall. So I encourage you to do both, to get your walking shoes on and to donate to the team effort. Again, it goes to Miriam's house who kind of acts as the hub for homelessness in the Lynchburg area and, and helps lift people up out of poverty and out of homelessness. So I encourage you to participate. The other thing is March 13th, uh, we are going to be serving at Parkview Mission again. Angie is working on the menu. Miss Ida is working on the desserts. So if you would like to make desserts, get with Ida and be part of the dessert brigade. If you are interested in serving that Wednesday night, just get with me or Karen Warner and let us know that you plan on attending and we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Belva. It sounds like a lot of food talk this morning. A week from today, so next Sunday, we will be having chili cook-off following worship. And that'll be $5 a person, $15 a family of three or more. And those proceeds will go toward the youth doing different things, including blessing bags and things to bless others. Anybody know what they need to do as far as participating in the chili cook-off? Do you just show up with your pot of chili and... Wonderful. So there is a there is a sign up, and it would be helpful to have a name for your chili and perhaps identify what's in your chili. And I think oftentimes it's helpful to indicate the degree of heat or spiciness in your chili, although that's relative. So if you're from Texas, that's one thing. If you're from Virginia, that might be another. But it's going to be a fun uh, event and great opportunity. Chance to invite folks. They can come to worship, or you can just say, hey, show up at noon in our fellowship hall and enjoy that time together. So, again, we're thankful for that. Good to have uh, um, the Howells back, although Chris is home um, under the weather. So please keep uh, Chris in your prayers so that she'll be feeling better. Are there other announcements that folks might want to lift up this morning? It is great that we can be in worship and fellowship. Uh, let us quietly prepare hearts and minds to worship the living God as Susan brings forward the light of Christ.
I invite you to stand and body your spirit for our call to worship. From water to wilderness, God's covenant is continued. God's kingdom comes here. On stone and in hearts, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes here. From the ancestor of nations to the sun lifted up. We follow Jesus on the Lenten path. But where he is, we will be pray together our congregational prayer. Loving God, you have made covenant with us and with every living creature. We give thanks for the sign of the rainbow, for it reminds you and us of your promise that the flood of destruction will not be the last word. We thank you too for the waters of baptism, the sign that we are raised as children of the covenant through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
invite Taylor to come forward for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel reading is Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, the baptism of Jesus. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. The temptation of Jesus. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. The beginning of the Galilean ministry. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. may be seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Almighty God, we thank you and praise you for this time of worship. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come near the throne of grace. Lord, as The word has been shared, and now may it be proclaimed. Let us hear it with joy. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and redeemer. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. This will be my quick commercial this morning for our Lenten devotional. How many folks have the Lenten devotional now. If you don't, there were some copies there. There are plenty in the back, and there are even more in the, what do y'all call that? Breezeway. Thank you. That's what I thought it was called, but I didn't want to mess it up too badly. How many of y'all, okay, this is confession time. 
How many of you all have started reading it? Wow, I am so impressed. Well, I have a confession to make. I haven't been reading it. But Sarah has been reading it to me each evening. And it has been awesome. I mean, I, 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 again, another confession to make. I'm like, the devotions that I put in are so bad compared to your all's. <laughs> it's like, y'all are going to be like, now, isn't he supposed to know what he's doing? The good news is that God doesn't judge us that way, right? God doesn't say, well, you know, Chris really knocked it out of the park with her devotion, but, but ben, ben was having a rough day when he wrote his. Each one of those devotions come from your heart. And I am just blown away by the depth of God's love and the way that God is using each one of you all in, in sharing those devotions. And so um, I just want to lift up the, the four that I haven't read, but Sarah has read to me so far. And um, one of those was from Karen Bell talking about the incredibly difficult and scary experience of their son Josh's accident and the aftermath of that, and yet God working in amazing ways, being close to Vanderbilt Medical Center. And I will never forget pizza soup that apparently the dietician had no idea what pizza soup was or it couldn't have possibly been. And yet in God's providence and care, that was what was served or at least eaten and experienced by Josh to begin that process of building strength. That was just an incredible thing. And then we go from that and we we get the story of, of Ida's terrible accident and what the experience of that was. I will never forget thinking about how she communicated uh, to Bill, right? Or to, to Bill, I thought. Um, and she wrote on his hand what? I O K. And then she shared a little bit about how the Sunday school class provided meals and how someone just showed up one day and said, well, you all need a car, so here's a car to use. Chris isn't here, so I can brag on her because that way, you know, she doesn't get as big a head unless she's watching. And she shared about what it meant to share God's love with somebody who wasn't quite sure I believe his name was Gary. And then when, when Gary died, she considered, well, again, how did God work in Gary's life? And then, the, uh, again, not in chronicle, chronological order, but the, the other devotion of the first four was from Sally Peters. And she shared the experience of taking care of her husband of, 60 years or so, I guess. And yet there was still God's grace in the midst of that in the period of COVID. So I lift these up because they help us on our Lenten journey. And they speak to how God's love is real and particular and specific. Now, in Mark's account of, of this story, there aren't a lot of details. Mark is sort of like the Ernest Hemingway of the gospel writers, right? How many of y'all have read Ernest Hemingway stuff? He didn't spend a lot of time on details and, and lots of color and lots of, you know, extraneous stuff. It was movement and action. And that's... Mark's gospel. 
begins with the baptism of Jesus. And unlike in Matthew and Luke's account, the Holy Spirit descends and does what? Tears open the heavens. Where else in the New Testament is something torn? The curtain, right? At what moment in time was the curtain torn in the Holy of Holies in the temple? The time of Jesus' death, right? The Holy of Holies, the inner part of the temple that only once a year the high priest could enter on Yom Kippur. No one else could enter that. In fact, they had to tie a rope around them. You know why they did that? Because if he died, you couldn't go in and get him. You know, I imagine they're like tugging on the rope or like, dang, he's not coming out. And we can't go in. So we're just going to have to pull him out. Now, I doubt that ever really happened, but they had to prepare for that. They could not approach the throne of grace in that way, and that was the way they dealt with it. And so in Mark's gospel, the Holy Spirit tears open the heavens. And God speaks, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. But only Jesus hears this in Mark's account. In Matthew and Luke's account, other people get to hear it. But here only Jesus hears it. The Holy Spirit identifies and clarifies and helps Jesus himself to understand and recognize his identity as the Son of God. And then what does the Holy Spirit do? Is the Holy Spirit done? No, it does what? I shouldn't say it. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit drives Jesus, not literally in a vehicle, by the way, drives, pushes Jesus, directs Jesus where? To the wilderness. And in Matthew and Luke's account, we get lots of information about the temptations and, you know, temptations to, you know, make food out of stones and to have dominion and power over the, the kingdoms of the earth and to throw oneself off the temple and God would protect Jesus. And Mark tells us nothing about that. Nothing. All Mark says is, well, Jesus was tempted by Satan. And, oh, by the way, you know, the angels waited upon him and the beasts were around. Pretty much. Right? But now we get to where Mark is really moving this thing forward. Because Jesus now is taking the mission that God has for him out of the wilderness. And sharing what God has in mind. So immediately Jesus leaves and, and he goes to Galilee and he starts doing what? Calling the disciples. And he says to them, the kingdom of God has come near. As in, guys, things are no longer the same anymore. Something big has changed. 
Because when the Holy Spirit is work, things don't stay the same. And in, in this call story for the disciples, again, we don't get a lot of the give and take. It just says Jesus called them and said, the kingdom of God has come near, follow me, repent and believe what? The good news. And so, what is the good news? The good news is Jesus Christ. The good news is a person. The good news is not whether you can recite the Apostles' Creed or not, although the Apostles' Creed is good. In fact, at some point, we'll probably use it. We may use it for like weeks and months at a time, and you'll be like, I'm so sick of that creed. We got other creeds in our, in our hymnal. Can't we do, you know, don't do the Nicene Creed, because that sucker's long. True light of true light and true God from true God. It just goes on and on and on and on, but it's good. Maybe one of those shorter creeds like from the Methodist Church of Canada or something. I don't know. There's one of those in there. There might be a Korean Methodist Church creed in there too. Y'all can look. You know where to find the creeds in the hymnal? Where are they? Yeah, near the end of the book. What, like eight something, right? Taylor and Susan are looking at them. Like 817 or something like that. I don't know, whatever. It's after the Psalter. The good news of Jesus Christ is not a creed, although there is good news when we read and understand and believe the creed. The good news, the gospel is a person, Jesus Christ. That's who the, Jesus is calling them to follow, not a set of rules and precepts and suppositions and all that stuff. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus says, come and follow me. I am the good news. How many times do we hear in the Gospels that the I am statements from Jesus? Kind of echoes what God said to Moses when Moses asked what? Now, what, what's your name? Who am I supposed to say has sent me? And God says to Moses what? The Popeye verse. I am who I am. Tell them I, I am who I am has sent you. The good news of God is a person, Jesus Christ. And it's easy for us to lose sight. Because we have lots of ways of understanding it. We've got lots of layers, and we've got clergy and laity. We've got denominations. We've got districts. We've got conferences. We've got all this stuff. And please do not send my DS, Denise, that I was dissing all of that. I don't need that. I appreciate it. She doesn't need it either because she's retiring. The last thing she wants to do is deal with some crazy pastor. She wants a few months of things going smoothly. So here, very clearly, I'm not saying that that isn't important. It is important that we are part of the body of Christ at Centenary United Methodist Church on Rivermont Avenue in the Mountain View District of the Virginia Conference of the United Methodist Church. 
Because that is the particular place God has called us to live out the good news of Jesus Christ. And yet, we would love things to be the way they used to be. I'm sure for for some of you all who have been here for a few years, like Charlie Lane, you've seen a few things. Some of you all probably remember there was a time that it was expected to be a member of a church. That if you weren't a member of a church, depending upon who your boss was or what they were like, they'd be like, you're not a member of a church? And I'm sure that was true in Lynchburg. And so that was the expectation. You were a cultural Christian. That was the culture. That was the default. That was the expectation. It doesn't mean in the 50s and 60s and before that and the 70s and maybe even up into the 80s that people who were Christians weren't Christian, but there were cultural Christians. And it was good. It was to your advantage. It was good news. But may not necessarily have been God's good news. It just worked. And somewhere in there, probably in the 80s or 90s, and again, rough, we went from a cultural Christianity to a consumer Christianity where the important thing was, well, does your church have A contemporary worship service. Because the churches that were growing had a contemporary worship service. And the churches that were growing had a, a large and healthy and vibrant children's ministry. And a large and vibrant youth ministry. And let me hear, let me, y'all hear this very carefully. I'm not saying Contemporary worship isn't good. I'm not saying children's ministry isn't good. And I'm certainly not saying youth ministry isn't good. What I am saying is that was the expectation. It was a, an attractional model. If you did it well, they would come. Right? Peggy's shaking her head yes, right? Huh? Right. Programs. You had to have the right programs. You had to have the right programs and you had to have the right people running those programs. And if you did that, your church would be full and your budget would be balanced and the conference would love you. Guess what? The conference still loves you. They do. I hope you know that I love you. But that worked. It worked for for quite a while. As long as you got everything in order and you did what you're supposed to do and things, you know, and then somewhere in there, I know this is amazing, things don't stay the same. Something changed. You can look at graphs of churches in Virginia, United Methodist churches, I'm sure it's probably similar in other places. I don't know why, somewhere around 2007, 2008, there was, a, there was a bad recession in there. There was other stuff going on in the world. But it's like things changed. Attendance went down. Engagement went down. Not for all churches. There were certainly some churches that they were doing the attractional model even better and better. And they shuffled the sheep. You know what that means? 
That means that somebody, somebody's not happy at their church, and so they see this other bright, shiny church, and they go to that church. But new Christians aren't necessarily being made. They're just kind of getting redistributed. None of that works anymore. The programs don't work anymore. You can only have so many churches that have the best youth program and the best children's program and the best contemporary worship. We have to recognize that the good news of Jesus Christ is a person and it's not a program. The good news of Jesus Christ is a relationship. That's what I see in this, in our devotions. It's all about the relationships. Right? I haven't read them. Sarah reads them to me. But it's not about programs. It's not about that our theology is better than another church's theology, although I think Wesleyan theology is amazing. I think it, 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 it speaks to me. It hopefully speaks to the world of, of the problems that the world has. And it really speaks to God's love. But the good news, the kingdom of God has come near in a person. And when I read these devotions or Sarah reads them to me or from the Advent devotions, I see relationships that point to the goodness of God. That is the church. That is the church stripped of all the other stuff. All the stuff that the world loves stripped away. Philip Yancey said, wonderful Christian writer, that the world does everything better than the church. That's not the last word, don't worry. Because you're like, I am called the DS now. (laughs) The world does everything better than the church except grace. Except Jesus Christ. The world's got better music. Although we have really good music. We have, we have a, a great uh, music director and a wonderful choir. We have an amazing building. It's both our great blessing and our great challenge. But the world has all of those things. Just like Satan promised the world to Jesus. But what did Jesus hold on to? His relationship with his father. It's like it's been said that what, how do you know what you have in a church? The church is when the building burns down and the preacher runs away. Then you know what the church is. Now I'm not promoting, suggesting, encouraging either one of those things. But as followers of Jesus what we have and what we can offer is Jesus. How we do that, how we live that out, it may look different for one person than another person. But that's what God calls us to do and to be. And if we do that and we are that, 
then we can trust whatever the, the Holy Spirit decides. Because again, Scripture teaches us one person plants, another person waters. And who gets the credit? God. If we're faithful and obedient and sharing Jesus Christ, whatever that looks like, then we can trust that whatever God has, I don't know what the future holds as the saying goes, but I know who holds the future. And that's the good news. Thanks be to God. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, as we begin this journey of Lent, we thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness and the obedience of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. baptized in solidarity with us to take on the sins of the world, though he was without sin. Inviting us to walk with him, knowing that we would ultimately betray him. Help us, Lord, to recognize and see that the kingdom of God has come near here at Centenary United Methodist Church. That the good news is Jesus Christ. And that that's all that we need. That we share Jesus Christ that we follow Jesus Christ, that we love Jesus Christ, and we love the people of the world just as Jesus loves them. Forgive us, Lord, when we're too distracted and thinking that other things are what you have for us. Help us to be like those in Scripture who know the one great thing, the pearl of great price. To follow you. We look upon the world and its brokenness and the struggles and difficulties. You call us, Lord, to pray to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to pray for healing and wholeness in Sudan and other places where there is civil war, in Ukraine, where there is famine. We pray for those who are imprisoned, whether those be physical barriers or the chains of addiction. For those who feel isolated or alone, for those who are homebound, for those journeying the difficult path of seeking healing, and those who walk with them. Help us, Lord, to be those who listen for the still small voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we respond to those promptings to be more bold and trusting in your call to follow you. That we as a church don't look back, but see where we are and where you call us to follow. 
knowing that that's enough. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. fully human and fully God, willing to take on all for us. Help us to walk with him in this season of Lent. But may that season of Lent not be the time where we simply focus and then we move on. The kingdom of God has come near and his name is Jesus. May we be faithful and follow. And so we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray together. God of steadfast love and faithfulness, we are humble as we try to do what is right and to walk in your ways. Receive, we ask, these offerings and use them for your own good purposes in the church and in all creation. We pray in Jesus Christ. Amen.
Oh, give me grace to follow my master and my friend. The world does everything better than the church, except for grace. And the name of grace is Jesus Christ. Trust that God has given us all that we need to be faithful to follow him. May God's peace be with you as Taylor leads us out to the world with the light of Christ. Amen. Thank you.